Most crime that is reported, i.e. street crime, is committed by persons with a low socioeconomic status in large urban areas. So what drives this concentration of crime? What is actually happening here? The term lower class is indicative of a social structure. We live in a stratified society. People are grouped according to economic or social class. A segment of the population that shares a similar economic level and along with it similar attitudes, values, norms, and identifiable lifestyles. When using the term lower class, I'm referring primarily to individuals who are living in poverty, even if they are working full time and often multiple jobs to make ends meet. So, social structural theories center around socioeconomic conditions, poverty, social inequality, disadvantage, and along with it, hopelessness and despair, as a determining factor explaining crime patterns in deteriorated areas. Instead of trying to explain individual behavior, they instead focus on broader social forces impacting the behavior of anyone who is subjected to these same environmental conditions. This social structural perspective encompasses three independent yet overlapping branches, social disorganization, strain, and cultural deviance. But before we get to them, a little background. Recall the functionalist perspective of law as a means of exerting social control. Functionalism dates back to the late 1800s with French sociologist Emile Durkheim, who argued crime reinforces the accepted values, beliefs, and norms of society, and therefore is both normal and necessary for society to function. If there were no crime, everyone would think, feel, and behave the same way, which of course is not possible, so there will always be crime of some kind. Even in a society of saints, there would still be crime. How it is defined would simply change so all crime is relative. This explains why there are so many different definitions of crime across space and time. Therefore, all societies should aim to have their own stable levels of crime. He also argued crime is necessary for society to evolve and change by drawing attention to social problems. Without crime, society would stagnate, unable to progress. So, societal change and crime and disorder go hand in hand. A period of tremendous societal change occurred in the 1800s, arguably the biggest in world history, rivaled perhaps only by those of the 1900s. I'm referring, of course, to the Industrial Revolution. During this time, a fundamental transition in the division of labor in society took place. Durkheim termed this the shift from mechanical to organic solidarity. Mechanical solidarity was pre-industrial, where people were widely distributed across small, isolated, rural areas, growing their own food and living off the land. In this way, they were self-sufficient, able to provide the resources they needed to survive. People tended to know each other in their small communities and shared many norms, customs, and beliefs. This is contrasted with post-industrial organic solidarity. The population had expanded rapidly from about 1 billion in 1800 to 1 1.6 billion in 1900 and would continue to increase exponentially to 6 billion in 2000 and is now approaching 8 billion today. Much of this growth concentrated people in large urban areas, working for organized commerce in massive industries. The people in these urban areas had more diverse backgrounds, beliefs, norms, and behaviors. And because they are all concentrated together and working industry jobs, often in a factory setting, repeatedly doing the same task all day, as opposed to creating their own food and other essentials, they relied on one another's services to survive. Keeping this background in mind, let's turn to social disorganization, which centers on addressing why certain crimes are concentrated in urban areas. We'll begin with urban ecology theory, first put forth by sociologists Robert Park and Ernest Burgess in the 1920s, which set the stage for the development of social disorganization by looking at the conflicts and problems of urban social life and communities. They focused on specific aspects of the city itself, looking at how cities grow and how they create natural areas for crime. Specifically, they centered on Chicago, where they were based, a city known for a high concentration of crime. This is why urban ecology and social disorganization that stemmed from it are often referred to as the Chicago School, because of the groundbreaking sociological research originating there during this time. Chicago is a unique area, adjacent to several bodies of water, with two rivers running right into Lake Michigan. This is where Chicago originated, as it provides a natural source of sustenance and transportation. 
Burgess believed mobility was key to how the city was organized, and described it as developing from the center outward in a series of concentric zones. The central business district is at the center, where lots of businesses are all clumped together. This is surrounded by an industrial area filled with factories. Then there is the zone of transition, where there are more factories, but also large housing structures designed for holding many people, particularly those who worked in the factories and their families. It is where the poorest population lived, particularly first-generation immigrants who were trying to establish themselves in a new, unfamiliar land. It isn't necessarily where they wanted to live, but they had nowhere to go after arriving and no means to move out. This is a key point we'll come back to later. Next is where those who had the ability to move out of the zone of transition lived in the working class zone, where they could have their own small residences while still being close to the center of the city to walk to work. Outside of this is the residential or middle class zone, the largest zone with a bit larger, higher quality houses, where those who were a bit more affluent and could afford some transportation costs lived. Then on the very outside edges is the commuter or upper class zone, where the most affluent, such as business owners, lived in the nicest houses with the largest yards in a suburban or even rural setting. Now this model is rather simplistic and only really applicable in its time, as the city has changed quite a bit since then, and many other major cities did not develop in the same way. But it was the first model of its kind and a useful starting point for understanding the links between urban development and crime. This work was later expanded by Clifford Shaw and Henry McKay, who applied urban ecology and concentric zones to crime and delinquency in their development of social disorganization theory. They used official crime statistics to create some of the earliest geographic depictions of where crime incidents occurred by putting pinpoints on a map. This pointed them toward three initial observations about where crime was highest. In and around the central business district, which included the zone of transition, areas with high levels of poverty, those with low socioeconomic status, and areas with high numbers of foreign-born and black heads of household. Now there are two ways to read these observations. One is to look at each individually. Taking this simplistic approach, it would be easy to make the assertion that crime is a function of being poor, black, or an immigrant. Or, all three could be considered closely interrelated because they all share the same underlying characteristic, location. This is what Sean McKay concluded. To understand what was happening, it is important to look at urbanization patterns in Chicago in the late 1800s and early 1900s. There was a massive increase in the population during this time, doubling every 10 years. This growth occurred through several major waves. First were German and Irish immigrants, then Italian and Polish immigrants, and then, later, blacks from small towns and rural areas. Each subsequent wave that arrived in the city initially lived in the same types of neighborhoods, in the zone of transition, near the center of the city, close to employment, and cheapest to live in. These areas also happened to be where crime was most heavily concentrated as well. The demographics of the area was constantly changing. New people moved in, others who were there previously moved out. But, regardless of who lived in the zone of transition, patterns of crime remained the same. They were very stable, consistent over time. It did not matter who lived there. The specific racial or ethnic demographics did not matter. Crime was still very high there regardless. This points to the conclusion that crime was not a reflection of the individuals themselves. It instead had something to do with the conditions of the area. So here is how Shaw and McKay explained social disorganization. As workers living in the zone of transition became a little better off as time went on and moved up from the lower class to the working class and then to the middle class, they moved out to each subsequent concentric zone. A similar movement occurred in the latter half of the 20th century as those in the middle class moved away from cities into the suburbs. It's important to note, too, that much of this movement came from second-generation immigrants who didn't face the same barriers as their first-generation parents. Limited opportunities, resources, education, and English as a second language. As a result, poverty became concentrated in the more central zones. Only the most disadvantaged, with little opportunity for advancement, remained. There was a heterogeneous mix of many different people in the zone of transition, constantly moving in and out, unfamiliar with each other's backgrounds, beliefs, attitudes, religions, customs, norms, even languages. This created a persistent potential for conflict when lots of people who don't even know how to communicate with one another are all packed together in the same place. 
Over time, due to neglect, the area became signified by physically dilapidated and abandoned buildings. All of this combined with other social problems concentrated in the same areas results in social disorganization, and this social disorganization leads to crime. Crime, then, is seen as a natural and normal response to environmental conditions faced in these socially disorganized areas. Some elements of social disorganization theory have been supported when tested through empirical research, particularly the proposition that crime is highest in areas with high levels of economic and social instability and mobility, regardless of the ethnic or racial composition of the people living in those areas. But it has been heavily criticized as well. One proposition that has not been consistently found in other areas is the concentration of crime near the center of cities that decreases when moving outward. In many places, in fact, the most affluent live in the city's center, so different places have different crime patterns. Tests of social disorganization have been criticized for not carefully measuring the concept, essentially relying on circular reasoning, with the presence of high crime used as evidence of social disorganization, which is then pointed to as a reason for high crime. Also, if living in these socially disorganized areas leads to crime, why do so few people who live in them engage in criminal behavior? Yes, street crime rates are higher, but the vast majority of people living there still don't commit crime. Another criticism is that the concept of social disorganization represents a values-based judgment against the lower class. And perhaps these areas are not disorganized, but instead organized around different values and norms. We'll come back to this idea with cultural deviance theories later. And finally, while it hasn't been tested much in non-urban areas, social disorganization isn't necessarily just an urban phenomenon. Elements of it could help explain the conditions found in many rural and suburban areas as well. Next, we turn to strain theories. Now, recall back to the background established with Durkheim and the shifts in the division of labor in society. He argued these rapid societal changes led to instability and uncertainty. Shifting values upsets the existing social order and creates social turmoil and chaos, leaving social structures and institutions in disarray, desperately trying to figure out how to adapt. This resulted in what Durkheim called enomi, a state of normlessness, where society loses its ability to exert social control over people's wants and desires. The ability of the law to keep social order becomes severely strained. This inevitably contributes to various social problems, mental illness, suicide, delinquency, and crime. This idea of anomi was later adopted by Robert Merton with strain theory, which aims to explain why crime varies across societies as well as the distribution of crime within society. Anomi resulting from societal changes is seen as a constant force. It's always present. People want to achieve accepted societal goals of success. The established means through which these goals should be achieved are education, hard work, sacrifice, and taking advantage of opportunities to move up the ladder to higher paying jobs. But competition for success creates conflict. Blocked opportunities and means to succeed results in strain. Reactions or responses to strain vary across society depending on social structure. The impacts of anomi are most pronounced among the lower class due to an uneven stratification of wealth. Wide divisions between the rich and the poor create an atmosphere of envy and mistrust. This social inequality leaves them vulnerable, frustrated, and angry. They don't know how to respond, how to improve their lives, how to succeed the way they've been socialized into believing they should. Those who adhere to the goals of society but lack the means to attain them seek alternatives. This ultimately creates pressure to engage in antisocial and criminal behavior. Merton identified five adaptations to strain resulting from the combination of either accepting or rejecting societal and cultural goals and the institutionalized or established means of achieving those goals. The first is conformist, accepting both the goals and the means. Conformists embrace the desire for success and wealth and believe they can be obtained through legitimate means, even if most don't actually achieve huge success. Naturally, this is the most common adaptation. After all, if most people were not conformists, society wouldn't be able to function. The second adaptation is the innovator, embracing the goals but rejecting the means. Innovators are the most likely to be criminal, turning toward illegitimate means of success as a response to restricted opportunities through legitimate means. The presence of innovators who are succeeding financially through crime then creates more strain for others to commit crime as well. Third is the ritualist, rejecting the goals but accepting the means. 
Ritualists know they will never grab the brass ring, achieve major success, but still engage in the processes mandated by society. Think rule-oriented, mid-level bureaucrats. Ritualists are considered the least likely to engage in crime because they've abandoned the goal to succeed financially. Fourth is the retreatist, rejecting the goals and the means. Retreatists exhibit no interest in traditional measures of success or engaging in hard work to achieve them. They can't deal with the strain, so they drop out, withdraw mentally and physically. They're the most likely to turn to drugs or alcohol or become drifters. And then finally, there is the rebel, rejecting both socially accepted goals and means, but unlike the retreatist, developing alternatives instead. They consider themselves to be on the outside of conventional society working toward their own ends. One example being revolutionaries who want to change the existing social structure. A later adaptation of Merton's strain theory from the 1990s is Stephen Messner and Richard Rosenfeld's Institutional Anomie Theory, which focuses on structural anomie in American society. The theory has several components. First, there is an imbalance of power in American social institutions. Economic functions and roles, a person's job and money, are more highly valued, while non-economic ones, family, school, community, are all devalued. When roles are in conflict, economic wins out. This can also be seen in how much people who fulfill different societal roles are paid. A banker is paid much more than a teacher or a police officer, for instance. This imbalance of power in favor of economic over all others results in weaker social control institutions. The American dream is seen as both a goal and process of socializing people into accepting that material wealth is achievable for anyone who works hard enough. These are the generally accepted and recognized standards of success by which all members of American society are judged. There is an immense pressure to achieve at all costs, which restricts desires to achieve goals not directly tied to building material wealth. But most people are unable to attain what is promised by the American dream. Not everyone has the same access to the legitimate means of success. There is an unequal distribution among social class and status. As a result, U.S. society is highly anomic. This results in the breakdown of social cohesion. Individual ambition is valued above the collective good contributing to a weaker sense of community, driving people apart. At the same time, the U.S. capitalist economic system strongly encourages innovation. And what does strain theory identify as an innovation to achieve success? Crime. So, according to institutional anomie theory, this explains why crime rates are so high in American culture compared to many other industrialized countries around the world. There is an imbalance placed on the importance of goals over legitimate means to succeed. It's the idea that once you make it, once you gain success through wealth, it doesn't really matter how you got it, even if it was through dealing drugs, theft, or fraud. A drug dealer, for example, may live in a nice house, far removed from the poorer areas those drugs have ravaged. If you amass riches by taking advantage of employees and treating them poorly, by grifting people, or even just outright fraud, you're still respected and considered a success. You could even be elected to high office. Another strain theory adaptation developed around the same time that has received a great deal of support is Robert Agnew's general strain theory, which takes more of a social-psychological approach and draws on elements of social learning, social control, and social disorganization. Agnew recognized the complexities and wide variety of potential sources of strain. Strain could come from the failure to achieve goals positively valued by society, or a disconnect between what one expects to achieve and what they are actually able to achieve. It could also result from the removal of positive stimuli, the death of a close friend or loved one, a divorce, other family conflicts, or the introduction of negative stimuli, stressful life events, loss of a job, poor school performance, abuse, victimization, sexism, or racism. The distribution of strains varies based on social class, position, and community. Some areas are more prone to crime than others. These strains lead to negative affective states, feelings of frustration, anger, disappointment, fear, and depression. Individuals who have not developed adequate coping mechanisms to deal with these emotions are more likely to engage in antisocial behaviors as an outlet to find some relief. Lying, dropping out of school, drug use, violence, other criminal and delinquent behavior. This helps explain why people who experience different strains react to them differently. Strain theories are some of the more widely supported criminological theories, although not without criticism and limitations. 
one centers on what is actually happening in the decision making process leading to specific adaptations to strain choosing to become a ritualist as opposed to a conformist or retreatist for example or choosing conforming behavior and avoiding antisocial behavior or choosing crime as opposed to other antisocial behaviors when subjected to overwhelming strain then there is the emphasis on explaining economic crimes, those motivated by profit, as opposed to other types of criminal behavior. This limitation was later addressed in general strain theory. And specific to general strain theory, what factors determine different negative affective states in reaction to strain, reacting with anger as opposed to sadness or despair that ultimately results in depression as opposed to criminal behavior. Strain theories also do not really address the differences in criminal behavior between males and females. Do females have different reactions to strain? And then institutional anomie theory specifically has not received much direct empirical research. Institutional imbalance in particular is difficult to test. The proposition with the least support is that Americans place greater emphasis on material success over legitimate means than other people around the world. And of course, the massive decline in street crime since the 1990s contradicts the central premise of institutional anomie as to why U.S. crime is so comparatively high. We'll conclude with cultural deviance theories. Like strain theories, cultural deviance theories explain lower class crime in terms of goals and means. But unlike strain, cultural deviance argues that criminals, primarily delinquents, as these theories focus on juvenile offending, do not share the same goals and means as mainstream or traditional society, but rather develop their own deviant subcultural values and norms. First, we'll look at Walter Miller's focal concerns theory. He theorized that people who obey the street rules of lower class life find themselves in conflict with the dominant culture. He identified several core values or focal concerns shared among the lower class subculture and how they promote criminal or violent behavior. One is staying out of trouble, handling problems yourself, avoiding getting caught or facing negative consequences. Another is smartness, street smarts. Not formal education, but the ability to outwit or outfox or outcon others. Seeking out excitement, hanging out, trying to be cool. Autonomy, maintaining independence, not relying on others, particularly authority figures. Losing control is seen as an unacceptable weakness. Toughness, the need to prove they are tough or hard, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And fate, a strong sense that spiritual forces guide destinies. It can't be changed no matter what they do. They may get lucky, hit the jackpot, have a good future, but it's not in their hands. The future's already decided, and they just have to let it play out. He then applied these focal concerns to gang subculture to explain why they don't seem to focus on long-term goals and values, but rather on the short term, the here and now. These focal concerns are passed down from juvenile to juvenile, generation to generation. Next is Albert Cohen's theory of delinquent subculture. He also argued that the norms and values of delinquents conflicted with those of the dominant mainstream culture in a way that supported breaking the rules rather than following them. This dominant culture assesses juveniles from lower class backgrounds with middle class measuring rods. But in reality, many lower class individuals don't have the tools or support to achieve them. The social conditions they face make it far more difficult. The strain for adolescents comes from attempting to look good in daily life to both authority figures, representatives of mainstream values, and their peers. Conflict and mistrust emerge as a reaction to the failure to meet mainstream expectations, resulting in status frustration. They lash out against perceived threats from the middle class mainstream, placing greater emphasis on obtaining social status through their peers. This results in the formation of deviant subcultures, such as criminal gangs. And finally, Richard Cloward and Lloyd Olhan's theory of differential opportunity combined Cohen's delinquent subculture theory with elements of strain, social disorganization, and differential association. They argued that differential, or blocked, opportunity for the lower class compared to the middle class stems from strain and frustration, economic deprivation, social isolation, and social disorganization. In response, deviant or alternative subcultures arise with values and norms of conduct conducting their behavior that conflict with those of traditional mainstream society. These deviant subcultures provide alternative goals for success and alternative means to achieve them. Differential opportunity points to how criminal opportunities are structured through different types of deviant subcultures. The criminal subculture centers around making a profit. This closely corresponds with the innovation adaptation to strain. 
It is found in areas with stable patterns of adult criminal activity, providing opportunities for illicit gain. Think organized crime, where criminal role models and opportunities replace those of the mainstream. Individuals who remain in these subcultures long term are likely to develop criminal careers. The conflict subculture is found in areas with few illicit opportunities for economic gain and few role models through which to emulate success. As a result of the inability to achieve economic success, they find status through conflict centered around violence and fighting. And then the retreatist subculture consists of those who have given up on both the goals and means of success. It mostly centers around the use of illicit drugs and alcohol. They are described as double failures, not good at making money as a criminal, not good at conflict and fighting. So instead, they retreat and escape. While cultural deviance theories offer a lens through which to better understand different types of juvenile subcultures and specifically gangs, they have been subjected to numerous criticisms. One centers around whether their values and norms actually differ from mainstream culture or if they just respond to it differently due to their environmental conditions, offering excuses and neutralizations to justify actions violating mainstream norms and values. Another criticism is what actually comes first, perceptions of differential opportunities or joining a deviant subculture. Then there is the emphasis on explaining the behavior of young men. Perhaps these subcultures reflect masculine as opposed to lower class values. To this point, if juveniles turn toward deviant subcultures because of blocked opportunities, isn't it reasonable then to expect more females to be involved as opposed to males, considering they face more barriers to opportunities? These theories have also been criticized for relying on a predisposition of what quote-unquote other people are like and what motivates them. Essentially, that it's not fair to paint juvenile subcultures with such a broad brush. Some are not criminal or really even antisocial. A lot of juvenile activity centers around people just hanging out together. Much is made about them hanging out in the streets. But this begs the question, where are they supposed to go? It's not really that cool to go hang out in your parents' house. So the street is a natural common area. Another criticism is that perceptions of deviant subcultures reflect how differently people are treated based on their socioeconomic status. This brings us to the ongoing controversy over the link between crime and social class. There are two main overarching explanations for why crime is found more often among the lower class. And again, we're talking about official crime statistics here, so street crime. One is that lower class individuals are more likely to commit crime. This is not to say there is something inherently wrong with those in the lower class themselves, as was widely accepted at one time, and unfortunately still persists today. There are many factors at play, as we've discussed throughout this video. It's certainly not a simple linear relationship. That is, having a lower class socioeconomic status is not a direct cause of crime. If it were, it's safe to say we'd currently be in the midst of an overwhelming crime wave right now. And while some preliminary data point to an increase in crime in 2020, particularly violent crime in certain areas, mostly large cities, it certainly is not part of a long-term trend of rising crime rates. And we don't know for sure what the actual official statistics will be, how they compare to prior years, and whether any increases may be part of the beginning of a new trend, or just another anomaly wrapped up in the effed up year that was 2020. The other explanation is that this class crime link is not a reflection of actual behavioral patterns, but of policies and policing practices in lower class areas. This leads us into next week and a look at critical theories of crime, where we'll focus more on these policing practices as part of a broader review of explanations of crime resulting from class, race, and gender conflicts. Until then, have a good one.